Welcome to the first lecture video for chapter four. In this chapter, we're going to see an entirely different branch of physics that, although it is related to the concepts from chapters two and three, has a different problem solving strategy that we wanna use and we wanna recognize the difference. Because this is a new topic and has a lot of new concepts for us to cover, there will be several different lecture videos before we start to see the full-fledged example videos that we're used to. We will still see plenty of those examples, both in Chapter 4 and the related Chapter 5, but we're going to see a fairly large change from the set of videos that we saw back in Chapter 3 that were just building on existing concepts, and it was mostly examples at that point. All right, so let's get started. What is this new topic that we're covering? Well, it's forces. Back in chapter two and three with kinematics, we were talking about motion without caring about the cause of that motion. Forces are really, in a very simplified way, the cause of all of the motion that we were talking about in the previous two chapters. Now, they're difficult to define fundamentally in a similar way that it was hard to write down a scientific definition of time, but the simple thing we can use to think about the forces that we'll be seeing in Physics 125 is that they're a push or a pull. I can push on something and cause it to speed up or slow down. I can pull on something and cause it to speed up or slow down. The more that we use forces, the better we'll understand them. The other thing we want to recognize is that in our general problem-solving strategy, the first step is always to draw a picture. In chapter four and in chapter five, we will want to draw the general picture that we've been used to, but we will also want to draw a second diagram, often called a free body diagram or a force diagram. This slide has two different examples of these um, free body diagrams. And in both cases, there is a general picture of what's going on and then the free body diagram to the side. We will be used to these as we start to see them more and more in our example uh, problem videos, and we'll want to draw them every time that we have more than one force in a problem. It is drawing the arrows for the force vector so that we can really think about forces as vectors the way that we introduced at the start of chapter three. Okay, so let's start to build up our conceptual understanding of the tools we'll be using in this chapter. Now, if you look at the table of contents for this chapter, it talks all about Newton's laws and Isaac Newton, but it's actually important for us to recognize that Galileo, the same Galileo that we talked about in chapter two when we talked about falling object problems, he also had a hand in building our initial understanding of one of the key pieces of information for this chapter, the law of inertia. So we talked in chapter 2.7 about his ability to build a, um, an experiment in his workshop that showed that things fall at constant acceleration. He also built um, some ramps to help him think about the idea of inertia. So he was the first to determine what we now think of as Newton's first law, and we will get the official wording for Newton's first law in a couple of slides. But inertia as a term is the natural tendency of an object to either stay at rest if it's already at rest or remain moving at a constant velocity if it is already moving. So the first half is easy for us to imagine. If things are at rest, then they're gonna wanna just stay at rest until somebody pushes or pulls on them. The tablecloth pull that we may have um, seen in the past is a great example of this, where when we pull a tablecloth very quickly out from underneath all of these different objects, the reason why they don't go flying off the table is because they want to keep sitting there stationary on the table, and we haven't really put, applied a direct pressure to them. If you look at uh, the table or desk where you're currently at, all of the objects that are scattered about, any coffee cup or pens or books, 
They are just going to sit there if you keep looking at them until somebody pushes or pulls on them. The second half is the part that Galileo put some measurements into thinking about and that is harder for us to uh, connect to our everyday circumstances. All right, so let's start at the beginning of this. The second half of the law of inertia is that objects will tend to remain in uniform motion in a straight line if they're able to. The way that Galileo noticed this was he built ramps that went down and then back up again. Every time he rolled a ball down the ramp, it would reach back up to the exact height that it started at. No matter how the ramp was angled on one side compared to the other, it always tried to return to the same height. So Galileo's big thought was, well, if he made the angle lower and lower and lower until it's basically a flat um, plane on the other half of the ramp, the ball would continue to move on its quest to get back up to the same height that it was before. And in a perfect world, it would keep rolling forever. The reason why we don't see this happen all of the time in our everyday circumstances is because there is actually something pushing on it or pulling on it to slow down an object, and that something is called friction. We will see friction show up in our example problems in chapter four, and we will have a very detailed discussion of what friction is and where it comes from when we get to chapter five, which is when it's covered in the book. So keep this in mind when we're initially working on problems in chapter four, we will start out with several frictionless examples, and they don't really match our everyday situations, but they allow us to see what could happen if we didn't constantly have friction fighting against us in our everyday lives. Okay, so the full idea of inertia. A body in rest tends to remain at rest. A body in motion tends to remain in motion with constant velocity. This is also the place where our textbook introduces the idea of mass, because mass and inertia are related to each other. The amount of inertia an object has is directly related to how much mass it has. And the easiest way for us to think about mass is simply just the amount of stuff, the amount of protons and neutrons and electrons that make up an object. If I have a one kilogram mass and a two kilogram mass, the two kilogram mass simply has twice as much stuff as the one kilogram mass does. And the other really big thing we need to recognize is that in general, in the lab and on Earth, we measure mass by seeing how Earth pulls on it. We are really thinking about mass and weight as being directly related to each other when we're here on Earth because they're proportional. However, it is extremely important that we recognize now and continue to keep in mind that mass does not actually depend on gravity. If I measure the mass of a one kilogram block in the lab, I can take it anywhere I want to and the mass will stay exactly the same even as gravity changes. So a two, two kilogram rock on Earth or sitting on the surface of the moon or in orbit around the Earth has the same exact two kilogram mass in all of those places. The difference is going to be the amount of gravity, the force of gravity acting on that rock. Okay. Now, it's important to note that in the depths of physics knowledge, mass isn't as simple as we're making it here in Physics 125. So this single slide is just to kind of highlight the fact that we are dealing with a simplified view of the world that works fine for our Physics 125 curriculum, but doesn't fully, fully describe the true understanding of mass that physicists have. When objects are close to the speed of light, so extremely high speeds, the quantity that we think of as mass is actually based on how fast it's going. When we get down to the subatomic particle level, we've been talking about how we just add up the protons and neutrons, and it doesn't actually work as simple as we think when we get down into the idea of quarks and how all of that adds up at the subatomic particle level. And at some point, we need to recognize that mass can be converted into energy and vice versa, 
with Einstein's famous E equals MC squared equation. Now, I said at the start of this slide, and I want to reiterate, here in Physics 125, we don't have to worry about any of these details. They're here just to make sure we recognize that there is more to physics than what we're covering in a single semester. And for us, mass can just be the amount of stuff, but if we really want that full understanding of what mass is, that would take a lot more than what our curriculum is able to provide for us. Okay, so before we end this first lecture video, I want us to be introduced to the idea that Isaac Newton's name is on all of these different sections of the chapter for a good reason. He was the one who wrote down the official fundamental laws of motion based on the observations and experiments that Galileo had run. He also discovered the universal law of mutual gravitation. We will be learning about that particular equation way off in chapter 6, but his, his name will come back up and we'll be talking about why it's important for us. And his third major life achievement in this simple list is that he invented calculus in order to be able to mathematically prove everything he was talking about. Unfortunately for Isaac Newton, we're not in a calculus-based physics course, and so we don't care so much about that achievement. But the other two we will see in our curriculum, and that first one we're seeing right now. In a very real sense, because of the contributions that are so pervasive throughout all of the other pieces of physics that we're going to learn this semester, Newton is probably the most significant physicist of all time. Einstein would not be able to have done what he did without Isaac Newton's contributions to physics and to science in general. So what we're going to learn in this lecture video and in the next, and we'll see in action throughout the chapter, are Newton's three laws of motion. They're listed here on the slide for easy reference. I'm not going to read out all three of these because we're going to approach them one by one. But we have started to talk about Newton's first law here, the law of inertia. Let's expand on Newton's first law here. As I mentioned before, due to our common experience, we are going to have a little bit of struggle fully understanding this idea of inertia for the second half, the part that something is able to continue to move without us pushing on it. We believe, because of the experiences that we've had, that we have to keep pushing on an object in order to have it continue to move. But that's because we're constantly acting against friction. If instead we try to think of any of the lower friction situations we may have been in before, if we've ever been on an ice rink and pushed something, it will continue to move a lot farther than what we're used to thinking of. That's because that friction is much lower when we're dealing with the surface of ice instead of something like a tabletop or a sidewalk. So we may be tricked by this for a little bit, but we want to at least recognize that there is this kind of, I don't want to say invisible force, because it is physically there. If stuff's sliding across a surface, we can hear it and see that that surface is in contact. Friction is only active if those surfaces are in contact. But we do want to recognize that it's not as obvious as someone physically pushing on a box or pulling on a rope. Okay, so Newton's official first law of motion. A body at rest remains at rest, or if in motion, remains in motion at a constant velocity unless acted on by a net external force. Okay, so let's break that down a little bit. What that's saying in a very sciencey kind of way is that forces change the motion of objects. If we have no force, then an object will just continue the same motion it had, either at rest or constant velocity. If we do push on it, it will change that motion. The last three words there, net external force, are worth a little bit deeper dive. Net force is the same as total force, so net profit, total profit. We're going to probably use net most often, but total is the same word for that um, idea. And external force comes from outside the object. I am not able to push myself over. Somebody else could quite easily push me over, but I can't push myself. It won't work. It's not an external force. 
Okay. When we think about this first law, there may be a couple of different ways that you see this phrased. Another way of phrasing it is a non-zero total force. And in math language, really what this is all saying is that the acceleration is zero unless the forces don't add up to zero. Now, if the forces don't add up to zero, now we actually have a situation we can do some math with. We're going to see Newton's second law in action in the next video and see a couple of introductory examples before we add more onto it. So I will see you in that next video.